I think it's bringing in time here, True Hoop. I do, yes. It's the start of a new week. Exciting times. Start of a new week. Uh, today we are joined live from Toronto, uh, NBA agent Bernie Lee. Bernie, how the heck are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. How are you guys doing? Good, good. I'm excited about you just showed you just held up a foreign object. Um, something I haven't seen in a long time. Do you mind showing us what the yeah, look at this. Everybody remember that? It's a go cup. <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to support your your local uh, independent vendors. <laughs> it's sad. Like our our family gets ridiculous. Our big exciting thing is every Friday we get takeout and we start talking about it on Wednesday. We're like, ooh, this is me coming to get a burrito or whatever. It's yeah, like yeah. sad, sad, that exciting. <laughs> um, so Bernie, you've been an NBA agent um, for quite some time, and your most prominent client now is one of the most interesting men in the world, uh, Jimmy Butler. <laughs> it's funny like he, he definitely uh people definitely there's no like in between on him you know what I mean I, I have I have noticed that and it's either um the conservative part of you views it in one way or like the fan aspect of you kind of sees the other way and like I see it from like the huge portion of like the other way like the majority of people that um you know, we deal with an encounter, or the, just those people that really like just embrace that um, aspect to them of, of almost uh, normalcy, if that, if that makes sense. They feel very like aligned to it. And I've noticed like from the prism of people look at, at athletes from the perspective of like, what would I be if I was in that kind of position? And he's like that guy you can look at and be like, yeah, no, I would be like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, like, there's no, there's no guess to it. So he was just on uh, Megan Rapino and Sue Bird have this amazing kind of drinking and inspired <laughs> talk show, which is fantastic. And Jimmy Butler to me is that he was the first male on the show. So he's this sort of, in some ways he's cutting edge, progressive, like, you know, digital, um, free thinking kind of that Jimmy Butler. But he's also like Pat Riley, uh, Tom Thibodeau, just like, factory worker like you know nine to five yeah. he's, he's both of those things and I've never quite been able to put it together uh can you talk me through that how do, you, how, how do we see him here yeah no I mean I I view him like a lot of um uh like the elite guys like I've kind of seen is is that kind of that duality um from a standpoint of um you know being able to earn enough um kind of leeway to express yourself and do all those things but there's a serious mindedness to it and like a, almost like a, a discipline that's required around them in the way that they kind of operate. So with him, it's like, I've always noticed that he gravitates towards people that are really like gonna hold him accountable to the level that he holds himself accountable. But then he also looks at it from the standpoint of like, how are they with like everybody else? And that consistency uh, is the thing I think that like really resonates with him and earns him a lot of respect, you know, like, cause you can be, however you want um, uh, with him sometimes because he's aware that, you know, a lot of people are probably paying attention to it, but he's going to watch you, how you are with someone, you know, down the line, so to speak. And that's when that consistency kind of shows itself. I think for him, that's where it kind of clicks. There have to be some moments for you as an agent though, where you're like, whoa, that's a surprise. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I, I mean, the, the awesome thing about him is like, I, I definitely know, because um, he doesn't necessarily turn off, like I'm never gonna kind of turn off. Like there's an amount of accountability there, you know, like he could call me at like uh, 11 o'clock on a Sunday and ask me like the most like detailed of question. Um, and I should probably have an answer for it. Um, and then maybe I don't hear from him for three or four days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, that, it's that thing where you can, it's been very interesting for me for like three, four years of, just kind of understanding a person under that kind of microscope at this kind of point he's in in his career um just how he he navigates like a day-to-day -day and how his brain operates it's it's really interesting to me is that what you think is the most that what we don't what we understand least about him we all know he's incredibly competitive he's a yeah. very very impressive player he clearly takes care of his body but would you guess that or is there something else about him that that you know special about him that maybe we don't you know it's it's just it's so interesting to me for him and and i think all the guys that are kind of have have gotten to 
um, you know, an elite level, be it either like a franchise player of a team or an elite player in the league and things like that. Like I've been watching like, like every other person uh, over the last couple of weeks, a lot of the last dance stuff and all the stuff like last night of just seeing like um, the different kind of, uh, compartmentalized aspects of, of Michael Jordan's life like him being in a hotel room and all he can do is just sit on the couch and be by himself and watch you know Oprah or General Hospital whatever it is right because like when you're in hotels you have basically like 13 14 channels so you're watching like the worst TV especially at that point right like there's yeah. no internet there's no nothing no streaming, right so um and how like quiet and normal and everything is like that. And then like, I, I've done it with, with Jimmy. It's like, once you, like he will, if the bus is at like four o'clock, we'll leave his room at like 3.57. And I know in my head, the, the space from when we walk outside of his door to get him to the front of that bus, what that next like four minutes of essentially like chaos is gonna look like. And I see it. So I'll, I'll see him maybe every like seven to 10 days during the season. Like this is every single day. <laughs> like I just, it's, it's amazing to me. And I think again, that ability to create your own normalcy with inside such a, a hectic and chaotic bubble is the really interesting thing for me, you know, and I, I've, I've noticed that for, for years. It's just, it's just a really, it's just a really cool thing to see a person be able to remain disciplined and still goal orientated uh even though it, it's seemingly like if it all this ended five minutes from now it's like well i've already done enough like he never thinks like that and all the guys that i've noticed at that level it's so neat for me that none of them do you know like you think about like lebron james for instance every time i watch him because i'm i'm thinking about it from like a logistical like business side right every second we've ever watched him for his entire career like he signed a hundred million dollar shoe contract before he ever played in the nba that means every single second of his career everything that's happened is happened from a position of almost bonus you know and it's such a it's such a neat thing to to realize uh a person can can operate like that do you think that's why he loves uh guys like riley and tibbs so much is is that organization to the to the final final uh the finer points, and then some authority to back it up, and maybe why he didn't like some other coaches he's had. Yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, who um, who you're referencing in terms of him not liking something or anyone. I've never really picked up on that. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but we're not well, we're not going to let you get away with that. We're going to talk about Brett Brown in a minute, but let's talk oh, about yeah. the guys he really likes first. I would say though, like the, the the what what I think you're you're like kind of honing in on is that process driven um, aspect. Like the way to operate, I've learned within a bubble of chaos is, is process driven. Cause now you're coming up with like five or six incremental things that you can measure that are gonna show you how to get from point A to like point like Z, so to speak. Because if you're reactionary to all the nonsense and, and, and BS that kind of happens along the way, you're gonna get really kind of off track. And then by the time you get down the track, you're gonna look back and not even really know what you were supposed to be doing. So like when you're talking about like Tibbs or, or you're talking about um, Spo and, and, you know, Pat and the organization that they've kind of built in Miami, it's like so like clear. It's like you're going to come in, you're going to do these five to six things and these five to six things equal success. And we know this because we've done it this many times. Right. Same thing with like Tibbs, like I, um, when he was in Chicago, that's when I, I had two different guys that were on that team. I remember one of them showed me his playbook one time. And it was like the size of a phone book and you would look at it and it was, it was all hand done as well. And he had like a side out of bounds play. Right. And for the side out of bounds play, uh, he would have like 11 to 12 different variations of if the balls blow the hash mark here, if it's here, if the referee's standing on your left hand side, when he hands it to you as opposed to like, and it was all these things, like it's eliminating things you have to think about. It's like this, 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 and this equals this and do it, you know, like almost like a video game, like you're, you're creating. So I think that's for, for Jimmy, that's, that's what he's gravitated towards. And that's what gives him that sense of normalcy. And then he also, you know, it, it, it always ties him back to like, this is where I started and this is where I'm trying to get. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of, I'm, I'm fighting the urge to talk for seven hours about this, all this research I did about LeBron and um, obsession in athletes, right? Like 
Um, it's very common that elite athletes have a little OCD or, or the characteristics of it. Um, I think because that leads to lots of working out, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you're inclined to go have a big dinner and stay out late with your friends, then you're less likely to be on time at the gym the next morning. Right. And like, mm -hmm. so if you work out OCD people to work out three, 400 times a year. Right. So that gets you, if you can stay healthy through that to the NBA and on and on. But, um, but does it mean that everything about those obsessions is real? Right. So like in LeBron's case, I would argue he's intolerant of like young, goofy, late to practice teammates. Mm -hmm. Right. And he almost never has them on his team, which, you know, he has a lot of Mike Miller's on his team. Right? Yeah. He wants the dude to show up early every single workout. Right. Um, that seems like a little bit of this, like, I mean, you talked a little bit before about like Rick Patino really cared about what everybody eats. Right. Or, or, yeah. you know, Tom Thibodeau cares about exactly how we're going to handle every single movement on the court. Like, um, something about that is very calming if you're worried about your teammates screwing around. But it's also maybe it doesn't feel like that free, easy game of basketball that people are falling in love with on playgrounds. You know what I mean? I, you know, I, I would tell you, like, I think it's also a reflection of um, just, uh, you know, essentially men in, in general. Like, I'm a particular person. You know, I would imagine, you know, you have particular aspects. <laughs> no. <laughs> what? <laughs> I that so, like politically correct right like <laughs> but I would tell you it's, it's a function of that and it's also if you think about like these people's lives right and I, I now like I travel uh maybe between 200 and 230 days a year right? not anymore uh, um, <laughs> yeah but I, I had been doing that I've been doing that for like the last 16 years it's like yeah. if you think about the amount of like upheaval that you have just by that being your process you're gonna like want to lock into the things that you can keep the same because yes. we, we as, as, as men, as adults, as like, you know, as a father, whatever, like you lock into what you can control. And when you travel like that much, it's like you're throwing all these things up in the air. So you're going to lock into like the one thing that you're always going to do. So like, you know, one of the things with Jimmy is like his punctuality is, um, is, is, uh, I'm trying to pick a really nice word in case he ends up seeing them. Like it's a pain in the ass sometimes. <laughs> Never late to anything. But he's like, I remember we were in uh, Minnesota and uh, it was before the press conference. So we're there for like two days. So we're going to use these days to try and figure out where we're going to go live. Right. So this real estate agent um, sets up a car uh, to go and um, uh, to take him around and everything. And there were two entrances for the or exits from the hotel that you could go to and it just happened to be the car went to the wrong exit so his brother comes down uh it was like literally 15 seconds late and the text message his brother gets is like well you were late so we'll see you later right it's like <laughs> it's just those like small things of like okay i can't be in control of all these other things so i'm going to be in control of this and that's going to be like kind of my thing you know and it's it's yeah. neat to like watch a person kind of create a process and do that because it gives them a sense of calm, if that makes sense. One of our guests, regular guests on this show has been Dana Smith, who's a science writer in Oakland. And she wrote a story about how like, everyone's baking for, in the pandemic because like the whole world is so crazy. But gosh darn it, you set the oven at, th oven at 350 and 35 minutes later, it does exactly what you wanted it to do and you have control over a little something. Right? Like, I, I would think too, like if you think of the way like normalcy is triggered within your own body, it's like comfort foods and smells and things like that. Yeah. So, like remember a story a couple of years ago about uh, the Boston Celtics always eating peanut butter and jam sandwiches. Oh. And yeah. now every team in the NBA does the same thing. Yeah. Well, 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 why essentially are they doing that? I don't know yeah. that it's like the nutritional value of those things, but it's that thing of like tying into, okay, here's normal. You know what I mean? That's, that's what that feels like. So what are your weird travel things? What are your OCD travel habits? uh coffee like I, and i i got this from from jimmy as well and there's a trainer um that's always with him that works for the team uh armando rivas um we'll find like these independent like coffee places in like every nba city we go to and now like we've done it in a way that we kind of have it down so like and you're trying to you think about like we're trying to find the most like hipster like tree huggerish like coffee place we found this one in orlando and i remember i went to it and I'm not like a, I'm pretty liberal, but even this for me was like, we go there, order the coffee, where we're standing at the thing, 
and the, the kid kind of turns and, and looks at me and he's got like a huge neck tattoo. I'm like, this is going to be my spot. Right. <laughs> and he's like, I'm like, how much do I owe you? He's like, you choose. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we're, we're, uh, ethically sourced or whatever. I was like, look at me. If you don't tell me a price to pay for this damn coffee, <laughs> you know, but like you can't get any more hipster than that, right? Like you can't do the value of my time is. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Wait, so do you have like a spreadsheet of all the hipsterish NBA city coffee shops? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If you need that, like and you know what? You're talking about the O C D aspects. Jimmy can tell you down to like the street address oh, of, my gosh. Like, of every single city in the NBA. That's actually the the book that he writes when when he gets done oh my gosh i really this is the delightful news to me like i love this yeah. i had a funny um i was you know in cleveland for a week for the finals years ago and at that time the coffee thing wasn't totally big it wasn't like every city had that coffee shop you're describing mm -hmm. but the start cleveland had did and so i made the journey from my hotel to the coffee shop that i thought would be the one i wanted to go to and sat, sat down there to work for the morning. And, um, and like, the NBA came through the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. I was, like, holding meetings. Like, oh, look, here are my coworkers. Oh, look, here's um, Matt Delvedova. Oh, look, here's um, Bruce, uh, the Warriors assistant coach. Um, uh, Frazier. That's almost yeah, Bruce Frazier. <laughs> yeah. 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 pull up a chair. Like, we're all Googling the same crap, right? <laughs> found one in uh, Shanghai. And, like, it, it, I'm literally, like, and hopefully I'm not like outing it now and now I'm going to like ruin it for him. But um, you walk in these places and they are not places you would be expecting to see like Jimmy Butler walking in three hours before the game starts. So you always get the look on people's face like, is it? Are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Well, that's the other thing I was going to say is like, so you're talking about the four minutes when Jimmy Butler's in the crush of fans going to the bus, right? Yeah. And right then and there, like being a superstar is so different from – every other human on the planet but you go just a hundred yards over there and you wear like normal clothes in a coffee shop and suddenly it's amazingly just like me and you right and i always think about this when steve nash uh, my first all-star game was 2000 in, in the bay area and steve nash was in that part of his career where he was injured in dallas and not playing mm -hmm. and he was just like this forgotten man yeah, i mean and at some point we took some bus to some obscure secondary media dining that was like away from the crowd. And, you know, I'm on the, where the free food is. I'm a freelance writer and, and I'm with my editor, I think. And we get to the free food and over at the next table, um, I didn't even recognize him. The my editor is like, that's so sad. Like Steve Nash, you know, eating alone, his career is probably over, you know, <laughs> it really went and it huh? felt like that at that time but you know he got healthy and things worked out all this and all he was trying to do is like get a free you know what i mean like look over the well hey next time like <laughs> is this part of jimmy's personality though where like i wrote i wrote a book a couple years ago where i talked in, in i had a chapter of the scientist versus the artist and the scientists you're describing jimmy as a scientist to me very very um left brain very organized very detailed i'm sure when he watches tape he sees little things um it, it kind of dictates his life and and he he needs everyone needs parameters right coaches need to give players an idea of what to do and then and then you got the players just play yeah. and so getting back to brett brown and obviously say what you can say but i have players who've told me that brett would scream at jimmy throw the ball inside to mb and jimmy is thinking and probably saying like, I know when to throw the ball inside. I know how to play this game. I've played it a lot. Mm -hmm. Coach just, you told me what to do generally. Now let me play. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and Spolstra is really good at that. Spolstra puts guys in spots and then trusts his players to play, holds you accountable to that for success or failure, but doesn't micromanage. And I think, I thought, I felt Jimmy, and I've, I've read this, written this and said this, I think he felt micromanaged as yeah. a guy that isn't an elite player and needs to be told to throw the ball, Joel Embiid inside. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? So I would tell you, like, uh, it, it's really interesting um, that you kind of brought that up. So I'll, I'll give you, like, a very specific thing, the, the exact thing that you're talking about. And sometimes how things, I think, in the NBA get a little bit, like, misconstrued. And it's because um, the personality is involved, and then the story just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what you're talking about, that happened in Golden State, right? They're playing in Oracle. 
Um, and Jimmy is on the uh, 45, like it has the ball at three point line, uh, yeah. right hand side of the floor. So the side where the benches are, right? It's really, really loud in the arena. And Brett was trying to uh, give out a play call. And he didn't think that Jimmy could hear it. So he starts walking down the sideline to, to say, say it. Jimmy heard him the first time because like he probably heard him like if he was just speaking. Like, right. As an elite athlete, he's learned like tune out an arena. Absolutely. You have like the damn train horn going, like I'm gonna hear what I need to hear, right? So he says it like three times. So by the third time, just from like a human standpoint, if someone says the same thing three <laughs> times, you get annoyed, right? <laughs> right. The fourth time he said it, like Brett, because Brett's an excitable guy, most coaches in the NBA, right? Yeah. Again, we're talking about this control yeah. aspect of it. He now is standing on the other side of half court, maybe like five feet from Jimmy, and he screams it again. By the fourth time, and Jimmy wasn't expecting him to be that close, he kind of like startled him. So what's your reaction as an adult? Somebody scares you. Like my, my son did it to me this morning, ran into my room at six o'clock in the morning and was like, ah, and I was asleep. And like my first reaction is like, to get him right <laughs> like as a, as a you know as a person if someone startles you your first reaction is right. fear of exactly. flight yeah so jimmy turned around and looked at him and was like hey man like <laughs> i got it <laughs> right. but and i noticed it because I, I i know jimmy i'm watching that game and i saw it happen i'm kind of like laughing at myself literally for like the next up until this happened uh now we're about a year ago for the next like couple of weeks i kept hearing like the story like oh like jimmy's like pushing back and, and no that's not the reality the reality is just it was a human interaction you know what I mean so like there's there's reason behind these things like I, I've worked with people before without like naming names that like do things um not knowing maybe necessarily they're doing them uh and they're problematic things right and I would say in the concept of like team sports uh those are probably the issue then you have certain people that are doing things that is part of like their process. They know exactly why they're doing it. You just don't know why they're doing it. Neither you can give over ownership to them and be like, you know what, you're going to get there ultimately, or I can push back and be like, no, 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 do it my way, do it my way. Right. And when you have two people that are encountering each other that are a do it my way person, at some point it's just, it's going to be a breakdown. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, David wrote this brilliant story. Uh, a while back about stealing without fouling mm -hmm. and we looked into some numbers and blah 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 and you know and, and found some st superstars of it and almost everything that happens on the court david can he's already noticed it and cataloged it and can discuss yeah. why it's happening but jimmy was in a category by himself and david's like i don't even know what he's i don't know what he's doing like he's just am i this right david am i saying this right yeah his his steals per yeah. his steals per foul ratio was just ridiculous yeah, most sick, guys who steal a lot foul at least some jimmy <laughs> and i watched a lot of tape on him it's yeah that's one of his really elite gifts but i think also goes to his scientist brain of he he he's done the analysis maybe not necessarily written stuff down but it's in there and he can read the game, so he knows what's happening sometimes before the offensive player does. But what do you think he's doing, Bernie? How's he doing that? Yeah. Where that comes from? It comes from that instruction aspect, right? So when he came into the league, he was a rookie. He was like the 15th guy. Like, I really wasn't going to play. He's playing for tips. So it, the thing that he learned in his head is like, okay, if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it, and then some, right? So one of Tibbs' biggest things is playing without fouling, right? Because he doesn't want – uh, to give the op the right. defense the opportunity to have set defense. It's kind of like the, the Bobby Knight thing. Bobby yeah. Knight used to, his teams uh, would continually shoot more free throws um, uh, than, uh, or it, it was some stat where he didn't really foul that much, right? Yeah. And the reason that he was doing it, because he didn't want to consistently and constantly play against set defenses. They would make more free throws than the other team would attempt. That's correct. And That's exactly the ratio. He was like, like, don't, just don't foul. So Tibbs tells Jimmy, don't foul. So Jimmy's like, okay, I'm going to do that times 100, right? Mm -hmm. Then it progresses over the course of time where he's trying really, really hard not to foul. Um, and I've seen it, like, kind of evolve over, like, the last couple of years. And, again, I hope I'm not telling, like, a, a secret that's going to change it for him. But – and Kawhi's like this as well. And Kawhi's the other guy that has, in the history of his career, has more steals than fouls. Um, if you watch the both of them, they don't show up the referees. Like, they'll be irritated here and there and everything like that. But if he has something to say, Kawhi doesn't say anything to the referees basically ever. But if Jimmy has something to say to a referee, 
he never like looks at me and is like, hey, you, or he always will be like, we'll call them by name, we'll wait till the free throw, wait till it stops. So nobody really, like, he's not like really irritating the crap out of these guys, right? Right, he's not calling them out. Yeah. Right? Well, he doesn't make a TV moment. Exactly, right? right? And yeah. I remember he, he told me a story. Uh, they were playing uh, Brooklyn in the playoffs. And one of the players on Brooklyn's team, a younger guy, um, didn't think he fouled. And he turned to the ref and he looked at him and Jimmy was standing next to him. He turned to him and he was like, um, hey man, like called him something innocuous. Like we didn't refer to him as a person. The ref looked at him and he was like, hold on a second. Who are you? Like, how do I know your name and you don't know my name? Like, okay, right? And then made it 10 times worse. Like, the rest are people, right? Yep. So, like, that aspect he's picked up on as well. So, I would tell you it's, like, it's a technique standpoint, but then it's also, like, an observation standpoint. Like, you right. know who the people are and, like, what he's going to be able to get away with and what he isn't. Um, and now he's earned that reputation where generally, like, he's not, he's not going to foul a lot. So, like from a human standpoint, the refs aren't expecting him to do certain right. situations. There's, David's story has this other thing, which I love, which is basically when it's a conventional basketball moment, right? Like yeah. someone's got the ball in position to score or whatever. Like you've got to be, you know, we all know the rules, but when there are breaches, right? When there's a loose ball or sort of a chaotic moment, like your story was about Kawhi, right? But you, you, you can go hell for leather in those moments, right? Like this is when, you, like once the ball's knocked free, like you can do anything and get that steal basically right anything like on the sidelines right on the sidelines or like half court when someone's trying to avoid like a backcourt or whatever and then there's a point of contention and what the tension point actually is what happened to the ball like charles oakley was like amazing for this right like you can run through the and no one's looking at that you know what i mean it's like uh we don't really care who hit the ball like you just split his head off a camera like <laughs> that bit, right but it's just again it's it's kind of human nature it is hard i mean i feel sorry for the ref. they're close up in that moment you're describing the ref is close and yeah. has to see that foot out of bounds or whatever right like they cannot see the like truck in the guy or <laughs> so it's it's been the interesting aspect of um of review and now we've noticed right so right. if you review an nba play you're going to see three different things that you weren't even thinking about right. but now that's not part of the review right. but you're only getting to the end point and you're like well what do like and that's the beauty of like because again basketball basketball is a, is a rhythm game it's an organized confusion game and you're coming up with sequences if you've done it for a bunch of times like this sequence typically goes like this and this and this person reacts here and that, right? So it's the same thing like with the reps kind of, right? There's an ebb and flow, like I'm going to miss this, but I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that, but I'm going to, it's just kind of what works. And when you try and make that finite, I think that's where, you know, there's been a little bit of a transition to it. Like the coaches challenge stuff. Like yeah. it's, it's just, it doesn't work, you know? I love to beat up the NBA and often do, but on this one, I feel really bad for them. Like I, years ago when they, first started having replays um we, something came up where it was like you know you're reviewing this reviewable thing but you also see this other violation in the tape right and i'm blogging away on true hoop like you idiots you just got to call it what you see right and they were like you know we had some meeting and they were like look you gotta understand like if we are going to review everything that's on the video then how long is the video yeah right are we gonna go back two seconds, four seconds, eight seconds, 20 seconds? Why not a minute, right? And, and then do we go, and it, it, they're right. That's how it has to be, right? You have to have that like, just like a trial, right? Like you're accused of a crime and we're gonna go and see if you committed that crime. Not just do we find anything, right? You can't have these fishing expeditions, right? And so I don't know what the answer is there, but I, I do think they're right that it, even, we, we, we as fans at home will sometimes see something on the review that they can't fix. And that's how it's gonna have to be, I think which speaking is the gift of experience, right? So there's been a transition in the pool of NBA refs over the last couple of years. we like, there've been retirements of like some really good long-term yeah. experienced people. And now we're getting a bunch of refs that have come like through kind of like the D league from it. And they're going to get good and they're going to get better. But you, you've definitely seen in the last couple of years, like it's just like a different like personality type. Like I always say to um, guys that I work with, like if you look and you have a ref that's like now in there's a bunch of the D-League guys that's like really like in shape and is wearing like a size extra medium jersey, you know you're in for a problem because that person thinks it's about them. 
right? Like I want dad body like Joey Crawford or like, you know what I mean? Like that's the, like, the, I know they, they know like, look, I'm just part of like the background here. You guys do your thing and I'll keep it organized, right? So like this group of like referees that you have now, like, like I think for, and I watch a lot of FIBA and like, you know, we can't complain about NBA referees. If you look at like the NCAA, like it's, it's hard. At first, it's a really hard game to ref. And second, like it can really, really be messed up if you don't have the right people doing it, right? NBA refs are amazing. And this like crew that they have now as they get more experience is gonna continue to get there. But I would say like last couple of years have been, have been tough. I was gonna ask you about exactly what you said. I watch, I watch uh, the European games, well, I used to during mm -hmm. the day and just scream in my office by myself scream and sometimes i have no rooting interest i'm just watching the games yeah i don't know what the hell they're doing yeah. i don't know what they're i don't know what they've called or how they saw it and then i get to the nba at night and typically i'm just relieved i could just watch the game they're not yeah. perfect but compared to what i see during the day they're much better wouldn't you agree to that Oh man! So if you want to take it even further, you should try China, right? So I do. I watch them. Try. I, I get that on synergy. Yeah. I started having like a bunch of people, like guys, go to China, and I would start watching the games. And I really, really know like the local like practices and stuff. And I would watch and be like, I, I like, where did you get that from? Right? right. Like so like frustrated. And then I started like going there, and um, you come to find out like they're cheating on purpose because like they're bribing the referees before the game and like they, it's an active choice, right? And you're like, oh, okay, that you're not just crazy. Like you're, you're a dick, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> well, and that's the like, it, um, Europe's had all kinds of bribery scandals, referees and other sports, right? And it seems unlikely to me that the basketball would just be magically protected from that, right? It seems like, yeah, probably some of these, some of these calls you guys are seeing that are terrible are the same still, same thing in Europe, right? Yeah, yeah, no, dude, for, yeah, no, for sure. And I would, I would tell you like, referees, again, they're human, so they're gonna get caught up in the emotion of the atmospheres that they're in, right? I, I've yeah. never really like looked at it, but I would be really like interested to see um, like what the science is behind, um, you know, more kind of boisterous home courts and how that has affected, you know, kind of um, arbitrary calls and things like that, but you 1,000% oh. see it in, in Europe. Have you seen this thing? I love this study, and I don't know if it's still true. This came out like 10 years ago, but um, so in, you know, in soccer, it's a little bit more managed now, but like the referee can decide when the game ends, right? So there's a certain yeah. number of minutes of stoppage time, right? And so now they post that it was like three minutes, but it used to be just, you just would never know, right? They just play until the ref blows his whistle. Well, yeah. for every extra thousand people in the stadium, yeah. like, the timing of the game would adjust to favor the home team. So like basically if the home team's down a goal and there's 50,000 people, they get a much longer time than if it's 20,000 people, et cetera. And I'm like, that, of course, that's how, of course, of yeah. course, of course, 50,000 screaming people wanting to murder you or lift you on their shoulders would affect how you would behave as a human being. Right? Like, Man, I remember the first time I would, I think it was in Turkey. So I, I went to a game in Turkey and, um, like the fans in the in the fan section on the other side of the arena started lighting flares, and I'm oh, like, yeah. well, "We gotta go! Like, game's over, right?" <laughs> throw, they'll throw batteries, right? They'll throw yeah. urine bombs. I mean, it's really <laughs> nuts over there. Yeah, right. You light a flare next to me, like the last <laughs> I'm thinking about is like, "Oh man, did was this one on the line? Like, I'm I'm going home, right?" Like, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you have some players still there now uh, that are still locked in? Yeah, so what I, everybody essentially in terms of like the space of time right now, everybody, everybody's back home. You know, the, the I had um, the highest level guy that I had in terms of Europe this year was in Italy. So that was maybe about a month before us. So you kind of got the view yeah. like, you know, something extreme is happening here. Uh, so he came back and, you know, I think all European leagues for the most part, um, especially that are heavily import leagues. So like three to four Americans per team and then other European guys from other countries. Right kind of realized like I, I should probably get myself home um so yeah that that for the most part but in terms of like a larger picture over the last like bunch of years it's just made way more sense to send americans to china um that are kind of like that nba level yeah. kind of guy or like on that that borderline it's like you could go uh for four and a half months and just play three times a week you don't really practice like they're really only like shoot rounds and you can make four to five to six times more money than you're going to in Europe. And they're always going to 
pay you on time. You know what I mean? It's just like every, everything looks at it. It's like, yeah, why wouldn't I do that? But how worried are you though now, um, just going forward with not just China, but yeah. including China and then in Europe? Because I, I know with the players that I help and they play all over the world, yeah. I'm very worried about revenues uh, for those teams going forward and yeah. what it's going to mean to be able to pay players. What's your, what's your thoughts about that? It's going to be tough because it's, it's largely um, either it's either supplemented by local governments are sponsoring these teams. It's almost like a tourism thing uh, or it's, it's sponsorships of, right. of local business. And anytime I think that you run into an economic downturn, the, the fat that gets cut is those kind of sponsorship types of things. Uh, so in terms of Europe, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, I would say the next like 12 to 18 months are going to be, going to be really really difficult um i think in japan and china where people have kind of been pushed and, and funneled more as it is um i think you'll kind of see like a leveling off and maybe a little bit of normalcy um and then you know hopefully for a lot of these guys that are uh guys that have been playing in mid to higher level uh european leagues now with the g league unionizing and kind of doing some better things maybe this becomes a better option so they're going to have, you know, essentially 31 to 32 teams. So that's 300 jobs right there um, that, you know, hopefully that that becomes a better option for those guys to, you know, maybe be able to have a bridge point in their career, make some decent money and just kind of see what doors that opens. What do you think about this G League thing? Sorry, I know you want to ask the same question. Yeah, no, just we, we've talked about this. Uh, Bernie, Henry and I have talked about um, the G League could have the greatest season in their history next season. And yeah. based on pure talent because of this opportunity, what happens from there, there's a lot of different variables, but yeah. we could have, an, we could have the, one of the best leagues in the world uh, and the NBA in yeah. America because of the opportunities in for the G League right now. Yeah, no, I, you know, it's interesting. Like, I would tell you the G League is like a totally different animal. Like, it's apples, oranges, and everything because what you're not going to get is that historical um, and kind of like year by year tie from like a fan standpoint, right? Because the players are turning over every, every season. So like, you're not going to have a person play for uh, the main red claws for like four or five years. And like, and that's where college, you know, has it, has it, um, has an advantage where, you know, European leagues and things like that, but just strictly from like a talent standpoint, now you're talking about like two different things. And I think, if anything, they're segmenting in the right way because, like, I don't know that the NCAA is supposed to stand there as a development model for the NBA. Like, that's not their purpose. No. Like, they, they've taken that purpose because it, it helped them from a financial standpoint and they've kind of put up with something maybe they weren't comfortable with. But, you know, it was time for them maybe to cut the cord and do something that's better for them. And by them doing something better for them, it would be better for them long term. It would be better in terms of the campuses, everything, right, and how their coaches have to operate. Uh, and then for the players that we're talking about, they're going to be able to go to, uh, you know, some of these G League opportunities be better for them as well. You know, ultimately, everybody kind of will benefit as they get through that transition of, of you know, okay, this is something different. Now we all got to jump up and down and scream and blah, 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 and move on from that. It'll probably be better for everybody. Can we, I, I apologize. In our little prep, I had some anxiety that we were going to talk about five-star basketball camp the entire time because you guys both worked there. And the stories were sounding great. And I was like, we should talk about Jimmy for a second so we can just get into the five-star portion. Now yeah. we're pretty late in the show. And already my head is like this LeBron, Rick Pitino story you told us. <laughs> like, 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 you guys need to talk five-star. Uh, no, we, we need to hear his story, though, about uh, when Howard Garfinkel, one of the two founders of Five Star, hooked you up for, with a, a job opportunity with Kevin O'Neill. If you don't mind telling that, <laughs> uh, we'd love to hear it. I noticed, like, when I first started going to Five Star, I'm, like, 19 years old. So I was, like, that college player that realized, like, within, like, the first 10 minutes of uh, my first college practice that, like, I loved basketball, but I was not as good as, like, anybody else, right? Like, <laughs> like thankfully, like, I was better in high school, so I was more, like, recruited, but, like, by the time I got to college, like there were managers that probably could have gave me a run and like I just wouldn't give them the opportunity to. So um, <laughs> I, I was like, I, I wanna like, I wanna make this my life. So, like, how am I gonna do it? So then you start thinking in your head, like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to be a coach. Like, that's like those who can't teach kind of thing. Um, so my generation is like 1998, 99. Uh, you go to like five star, right? I read all these books about it and stuff. And like, I, I had just been a sponge for information like that. So. I go to five star, I get to five star and I realize everybody like 
I wasn't smarter than anybody else, right? Like everybody was essentially there for the same purpose. Like you go there, you want to be in like a job market, you want to uh, Garf to like you. He seemed like he was like the rainmaker, right? Like he would open these doors and everything like that. My situation is even more unique in that I'm Canadian. So um, my job market, like I don't have a US work visa. So I can't go be like a high school coach in Arizona or I can't go be like a D3, um, you know, assistant coach. Like I don't have a job unless somebody wants to marry me at that point. But like, why would they, right? So I, um, I can only work for in Canada and there's only one paying basketball like <laughs> in Canada at the time. It's the Toronto Raptors, right? You talk about feast or famine. So I spend the next four summers working, and, and David, you know it, I would do these things called Ironmans. And what it was is like you would work all five sessions of um, the five-star camp in Pittsburgh, and yeah. it's like 100 and like 10, from like 7 o'clock in the morning till like, you know, 10 o'clock at night when you're doing like bed checks for like $120 a week, right? It was like, it was pretty awesome. But the trade-off is you're going to be in this bubble, you're going to learn, like during the time I was doing that, like, I saw Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, LeBron James, uh, Chris Humphreys, like Michael Jordan came and did a one-on-one -on -one lecture. Chris um, Humphreys is so happy to be in that list. Um, he was, he yeah, was a great he, player. Yeah, no, so nobody would know. He actually was probably a better swimmer. He should have been swimming at the time. Oh, what? He was yeah. a lottery pick. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah, Michael Jordan came and did a, a lecture. And this was like another lesson for me about like the way like elite athletes in terms of basketball, just do some things innately and don't know how they're necessarily doing it. So he comes to do like this lecture of one-on-one -on -one moves, right? You think like, oh, I'm gonna learn how to take you to a basket from Michael Jordan. So for the first like 10 minutes, he has a mic and everything he's trying to do. He couldn't like explain it. Couldn't, like he couldn't talk his way through these things. And he got frustrated to the point where he was like, you know what, who are the best 15 guys in camp? stand up one by one and he just played them one by he played them one-on-one -on -one, like one after another and he'd been retired for like two years at this point and i think he probably like golfed like you know that story that was going around with him and jeremy roenick drinking beer and stuff like I, I got the impression maybe that was his like thing right he went through these kids like they were like pylons like and they were, <laughs> they were really really good right so I do this my entire college career. The payoff is supposed to be that Garf is going to like take care of me at the end, right? Again, I have one place that I can work. So at the end of my college career, like sun, moon, and stars align, um, Kevin O'Neill gets the job as the head coach of the Toronto Raptors. And Garf turns to me one day, he's like, hey, and I've been waiting for this like, hey, for the four years that I've been coming there. It's like, uh, my guy just got <laughs> just got the Raptors job. And I'm looking at him like, perfect, Garf. Like, <laughs> and he's like, um, I'm gonna set it up, uh, and you're you're gonna go you're gonna go work for him, basically, right? Like, it's no frills or anything, right? And I'm like, okay, perfect, right? Like, I'll uh, the, like start setting up my 401k. Like, <laughs> you're really, really worried about me, Garf. Um, so he gives me uh, a number to, to call uh, Kevin O'Neill. They tell me like a specific day, like this was in like June. They tell me like call him on like August 5th, right? What? Who schedules calls that far out? <laughs> Again, right? Now that I know, like now that I'm like 20 years down the path and I realize like I'm just having smoke blown up my butt, so to speak. Yeah. At the time I'm like, oh, gospel, right? Yeah. So for the next like 42 days, I'm doing, <laughs> ever, uh, did you guys ever watch the TV show The Sopranos? Oh, of course. There, there's, remember when uh, Artie has to go back and get his money from the French guy and he's like having the conversation with him in the mirror of what he's going to say when he opens the door? Like, <laughs> so I'm doing that for the next like 40 something days, envisioning this conversation with him. <laughs> right? So I call, and when I call, somebody else answers the phone and uh, um, I say to them, Hey, uh, my name's Bernie Lee. I'm, I'm calling for Kevin O'Neill, who's the head coach of the Toronto Raptors, right? Are you calling the Raptors or are you calling some house or who, what, what is this number? Calling, like they, they gave me uh, they gave a number, me an office number essentially. Okay. I guess before like cell phones are prevalent or whatever, like okay. could have been so many different ways, right? My life could be so much different right now. But, <laughs> uh, they gave me like this office number. I don't know. Like, so the phone answers and it's like this, like uh, a woman's voice. And it's, you know, clearly like a, uh, like administrative person, but this wasn't part of like my mental plan. <laughs> so like, you just hit me with the okie doke, right? So they're like, I'm like, hey, uh, can I speak to Kevin O'Neill? They're like, he's not available right now. Can you want to leave a message, leave my message. 
right at the end, she throws me another curveball. She's like, can I tell him what it's about? And I'm like, yeah, they told me to call him better job, right? Like, maybe you'll just give it to me. I don't even got to talk to him, right? <laughs> so she's like, okay, like hangs up the phone. 10 minutes later, my phone rings, I answer it. As I answer it, it was like one of those Flintstones things where like it's already like talking to <laughs> and I, I put it to my ear and it's, it's Kevin O'Neill. You stupid, blah, blah, blah. I, you were given one specific job and you've already messed it up. The person you called and said that um, you're calling about a job, that's the person you're replacing. You weren't told to do that. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, and I'm seeing my whole, like, I, again, I've been doing this for four years. I think I maybe had made $900. Uh, I probably had spent $1,200 uh, in the process of doing it. Like, I, there was one place I could work for and uh it's it's blowing up in front of me so i i let him like let me have it for a little bit and i stopped and i was like okay coach i was like listen i did exactly kind of like what i was told you know I, I apologize there's no way of me knowing blah 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 and he says to me you stupid mother effer do you uh, do you think i would ever hire somebody that doesn't know how to take um direction and like as i'm like spinning my rolodex of like okay how do you get out of this one bernie before i can answer he just hangs up Oh. And I'm like, that, and hangs up the phone. And I, I sat there literally looking at the wall for like the next 15 minutes, like, oh man, like, I guess I'm gonna have to go sell like photocopiers or something. Like my whole plan is this was not a part of it, right? Um, yeah, and it, it, it blew up. And then maybe like a month later, I walked around in the days for like a month. A month later, I go to a basketball camp for Vince Carter. It's like the last like camp thing that I have to do before I have to go get like a nine to five. Um, and I go to that camp and, uh, the station that I'm teaching my demonstrator is Vince Carter. And this is Vince Carter at like, when he was like at the insanity. Point. Yeah. Man, yeah. Half amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Like he was so like nice at the end of that week. Um, he ended up introducing me to his agent his agent hired me as an intern. And that was, yeah. Wow. It's kind what of, would you say if that happened again? On a copier. I, I want to hear, what would you do if, 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 if you replayed it? How would you answer differently? I wouldn't even have called Kevin O'Neill. <laughs> <That's laughs> you know, I don't want to work for you. Like, What's he doing like, now anyway? Like, uh, hopefully not coaching. Or, oh, but please say he's <laughs> cleaning your car right now. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's always a, sh a schmuck, as we like to say in my religion. Just a, yeah. a mean he guy. He would be like, you know, because now in my career, I get a lot of the guys on the other end, and it's because like, I've done a lot of stuff in China. So once you've gone to a point where you've burnt like all your cards of working in the NCAA, in the NBA or in the NCA, and you're like your mid fifties and you still want to work, these guys want to go to China. So I would imagine, unless he's heard, I've told the story a few times. If he hadn't heard that, I probably would be getting a call from him over the next little while. Right. right. So I would have the choice of like, hey, okay, hey, hold on. <laughs> you remember <Yeah>. this? <laughs> so Bernie, near the end of every show, we bring in our hero Gerard Hector, and he asked a question on a video. Um, Maybe we should do that. We have some other questions too, but uh, it's time is flying. Um, Gerard, a uh, pro tip, uh, he has a good story about LeBron and Rick Pitino. If you want to ask him about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll let him read that one in. Bernie, do you have a story about LeBron and Rick Pitino? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do that one if you don't want to. <laughs> I, 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 I want to hear the story. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. It, Rick Pitino's back now, right? Like he's in. Uh, he's, he's in Iona. I mean, whatever. He's not watching this. It's fine. When I uh, when I worked at, at Five Star, um, I um, uh, LeBron James came as a camper, so he was like 16 years old, right? So at that point, he was only like six seven, maybe like 230, as opposed to like 260. <laughs> um, but he was obviously he was the guy that like everybody in America like wanted to recruit, right? I think he was in the 10th grade. So that week, uh, all Garf's friends got to come and do like lectures. And it was essentially their like selling point to be able to, to show uh, LeBron maybe they should come play for him in college, right? So uh, I think it was like maybe the second or, or third day. The first guy, uh, David, you'll appreciate this. The first guy was Pete Gillen, right? So like the ultimate like Garp guy, right? So Rick Pitino. So, so is Patino for that matter. Yeah, 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 thousand yeah. percent, right? Because they're five star guys, yeah. Rick Patino comes like the second day. Rick Patino's thing is like he he and he's probably still like this to this day. He really wants to show you like how hardworking and intense he is, right? And that's how <laughs> he wants like you to be. So he's his lecture was based around the ability to work out on your own. 
um, and the intensity that you should play with and all of this like kind of coach speak, right? Like a word salad and then some. Um, so he, he pulls up uh, three, um, three people to come demonstrate and, and do this with him. And shockingly, one of them is LeBron James, right? <laughs> so he stands in the basket and they're at the free throw line. He's like, I'm going to show you, this is, this is how hard you have to play. He's like, come at me, I'm going to take a charge, right? <laughs> Rick, I think, is maybe 5'10", like 135, runs a little bit bigger. So, like, the first time, like, Ryan comes in and is, like, really, like, oh, hey, right? And he looks at him and he's, like, I'm going to show you how intense I am. He's, like, no, I really want you to do it. Like, he's got a, a Madonna mic on, really, like, kind of, like, tries to light the fire. So, you see LeBron kind of looking at him, like, one, this old man's crazy, but two, like, <laughs> now he's pissing me off, right? <laughs> he goes back to the free throw line puts his head down and goes, and I swear to you, like, <laughs> he, he once ran through a client of mine, John Luke's the third, yep. uh, and uh, um, I, so I, I got to see it, like, years later, but at this point, I had never seen him do it before. He took Rick Pitino off his feet to the point where, like, it would have been, like, one of those, like, Duke, like, college charges where you're like, oh, like, the ref really would have, like, sold it. But Rick Pitino had this mic on him, and when LeBron hit him, the sound that he made was like like his soul emptied. Like, oh! <laughs> it was, what happens when you stand in front of a freight train, you know? It's probably not a good idea. You know, I say this. I say this all the time. Bernie, I say that. I don't know how you, often you get on the court with your players, but uh, I have literally told players of mine uh, who don't always look like LeBron, but they're all in shape and much bigger and stronger than me now, I would say, if you hit me, like I, I get out of the way like a scared dog yeah. in front of cars. Yeah. And I looked at one of them and I said, if you hit me, I'm going to fall apart like Mr. Potato Head. Yeah. <laughs> Arms and yeah. eyebrows are going to come off my yeah. body. I'm yeah. an old man. I'm my 50s. In yeah. my 30s, I'd have muck, mucked it up a little bit. But like, I can't imagine being hit by LeBron. All the time that like go and like try and break up fights and stuff like that. Or like even nice. like practices, like it's a part that you don't necessarily see. Like, there are fights that break up, right? Or coaches sure. sometimes that like will get into it with a player and you get to that spot where it's like, okay, what's the next thing? The next thing is a fight. And those coaches don't back down from that. And it's like, hey, you know, like I had this one coach that was in the G League and he had this one guy on his team that was like, he was prone to, you know, he was going to do something <laughs> at some point. And I remember I said to him, if this ever happens, just know you just got to get him to the ground and then people will help you. <laughs> like, whatever you do, like, just tackle and just pray, right? Like, but they're nuts. Like, players are so insane. They're huge. Oh, you can't even. It's, I had a game this year. You guys are like this. So we, I, was help, I normally didn't sit on the bench because my son played. But for whatever reason, I think our offense, according to couldn't come. So the head coach asked me because it was all my offense anyway. So I sat down and it was the roughest game we played all year as a post grad team. Uh, so a bunch of college-age kids. And the referees didn't call anything. It was a morning game. They were lazy. And we had a big 6'11 Romanian kid that I thought had a pretty quick temper and, uh, and a rough kid. And their team was really rough. And I'm, I never say a word to the referees almost ever. Uh, for what you said about Jimmy Butler, I love that. Be respectful to them and you'll get calls back. That's how I felt. But clearly this game is getting out of hand. Plus my beautiful boy was on the court. I don't want him to get smushed. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm chirping a little bit like, guys, you're, you're going to lose control here. Timeouts. All the referees know me at this point. I'm like, guys, you're losing control of this game. So sure enough, the, the, our remaining kid gets fouled once or twenty times. He starts throwing punches. A brawl <laughs> begins to ensue from a couple players anyway. I don't remember this, but I've seen it on video. While this is happening, I lean back in my chair and did this. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Because what I, I didn't do, you. what I did do is get on the court and start throwing punches with these people, you know, a third my age almost. Nope. <laughs> yeah, no that's that. that's by Patino. But yeah. this is a vacation move. This is like, I love it. Oh my god! <laughs> my way of saying, don't mess with me. I served my time. I paid my dues. <laughs> the, 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 the ultimate. I told you so. Underbelly to show, like I'm not the enemy, right? Like right. Exactly. Like we run out of energy. I'll be here to have the conversation we right. need to have. But, and right. if you have a margarita, you could bring it to me. <laughs> hey, hey, Bernie, quick, quick, quick question for you, Bernie. Yeah, right. um, obviously, for so many people, guys like Jimmy, right? Their gift is their curse, right? Like Jimmy bet on himself like his whole life, like he, which is why, of course, he has so many problems with guys like Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins, and he's like, "You're so talented, why don't you work?" Right? But have you ever, into, and what you can share with us, get into his. Uh, What's it like where you have an idea for him where you know, look, 
I think this is best for you. Or you're trying to convince him of something, but he's just Jimmy. He's like, nah, that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. Like, I know this is me. Like, what, what are those kind of conversations like, if you can share? I mean, I, I would tell you, like, the gift of every, like, human being walking the planet is perspective, right? So, like, the, the gift with him is, like, having enough of a relationship that he knows, like, you know, I'm not just going to um, – I'm not just going to pop off just for the sake of like kind of hearing my own voice and he can tell me to beat it. And he can tell me like, you know, he doesn't even have to acknowledge that he's heard what I've said. You know what I mean? Like that's not necessarily the point. Like I know ultimately with him that there's nothing I'm going to be able to tell him about himself that he hasn't thought like a couple of days ago. It's just a matter of like verbalizing and maybe talking it through or like saying like, this is the perspective that's outside of your own head, so to speak. And then you think about it. And that's true for me, that's true for you, that's true of everybody, right? Like the gift of perspective is that that's it, right? It, like it's been so interesting with me, you know, we're watching like the last dance up we were talking about it earlier and like Shaq and Kobe and like all those things. Like if you look at it, all these guys that in the moment that have been in these things that these, these computational um, and it seems like life defining or altering, you know, situations at the time and nobody can like just calm down and whatever whenever you deal with these guys 10 to 15 years after the fact and they look back on it and they're old men or whatever, uh, and the emotions were moved to the situation, they're all realized like, except maybe one of them now. Won't except for Michael, because he hates Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, not, that's never going to change. <laughs> and even him, you can see a little bit of the mellowing, right? Like you see a little bit of it, but they all can realize like, you know, maybe I could have did that differently. And you think about it at the time, and I've, I've said this a lot over the last couple of weeks, like, imagine if you could have that perspective in the moment. You didn't have to do these dumb things to learn from them. I mean, not necessarily dumb things, but these emotionally driven things, right? right? right. So it's like, it's that, that introduction of, like, perspective. But I don't ever offer that perspective from the standpoint of saying, like, I'm right and you're wrong. It's like, well, maybe you could think about this as well, and then you know, you come up with like a rounded thing, right? But I don't ever do it from the standpoint with him or anybody that I deal with um, that I know better than, you know, essentially you, you know what I mean? Everybody knows what's best for themselves, I think. Sometimes they just don't want to admit it. I feel like you just wrote a self-help book that I would buy. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, if I could live my own life the way I tell everybody else to live. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, no, I, we don't have to work. I mean, just walk around being happy. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do better than end there. That's like the best possible ending of a show. Um, Gerard, David, Bernie, um, I feel like we have to have you back because we have more to talk about. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining us. We'll do it again. 11 o'clock Eastern every weekday. Bring it in.